Welcome to Eventful Endeavors, secrets to crafting the perfect celebration. If you're planning an event and looking for useful tips from industry experts, you're in the right place. So get ready to take some notes and we'll dive right in. This is Eventful Endeavors. All right, all right. Welcome back to another episode of Eventful Endeavors. I'm really excited today. We are here with Kimball, who is the event manager over at the Space Needle in uh, Seattle, Washington. So this is probably the most iconic venue, iconic uh, thing we've had yet. So uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So before we even jump into the venue, uh, talk to me a little bit about yourself, because you told me some of this stuff, how you were doing journalism, then came into events. And uh, at some point in there, you were Miss Seattle. So just run me through your story so I can clarify what's happening. You know, yes, what, how'd absolutely. you get into this? I think it's just, I will say, I absolutely never, so I'm the sales manager at the Space Needle and Chihuly Garden and Glass. We manage private events at both properties. Um, and I will say, I absolutely, at least Kimball growing up and going to school, never thought once I would have sales manager in my title or that I would be here right now. But basically in school, um, I was thinking I was going into, going to go into broadcast journalism, worked super hard to like finally get my foot in the door at this new station. It was a radio station, um, which was a little sister, um, uh, to ABC. It was an ABC affiliate. So it's like, all right, like I finally made it. You know, I was actually joking with one of my coworkers earlier that I was like, this was the type of like, I'll scrub the floor with my toothbrush. Like, I'll do whatever it takes to get <laughs> yeah. my foot in the door in this industry. Um, and then I finally did. And it took so long. Um, and I started working there. And I, it, I can't remember exactly when it hit me, but maybe around six months in, I was doing these overnight shifts, right? Because I was the, new mm -hmm. with the terrible schedule. Um, and I remember sitting in the studio thinking, I'm sitting in this small, dark studio on a hill and kind of in the middle of nowhere, talking about these things that are going on and just feeling so disconnected from it. Like, I'm just not a part of what's happening and creating those moments and really being a part of that community. I felt very disconnected. And so from there... Um, and probably also because I was feeling depressed in the news world, working these overnight shifts. Sure. Um, I wanted yeah, to just start getting more out in the field, out in the community. I was already a part of other organizations where I was volunteering and a part of a lot of events. I just never really put together that events could be what I actually do. And then um, news taught me that I didn't want to work in news. And I wanted to go more lifestyle culture. So I ended up getting a job. Um, it was at Seattle Met Magazine where I start to, I got to be a part of um, more of that lifestyle culture and event world. They had an event department over there that honestly was just started helping them. And then before I knew it, I was like, here I am. I'm like in the community. I'm on site. I'm connecting with these people and meeting them there. And I'm making a friend on the catering team. Like, everything just started to feel really connected and really powerful. Um, and one of the reasons why I love events and hospitality too, is I just, it's that connection to people that drives me for sure. So I love coffee, but I also like my caffeine <laughs> is people and connection yeah. and relationship building. And even more so now in sales that like business development. Um, and then one event job just kind of turned into another, I put in, Quite a few years, honestly, just with my head down, um, humbly working. We get our butts kicked a lot in the event yep. hospitality world, especially when you're going, when you're in events and hospitality through COVID, right? We all learn so much through that. Um, but putting the work in and just kind of, you know, working on turning those wheels, making those connections, eventually it was actually a personal connection um, that helped me get, or through networking too, but um, that helped me get my foot in the door here. And now here I am on this events team, which like you said, the most iconic spaces in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. That's really exciting. So how did the, how did Miss Seattle come about? Talk to me about that. <laughs> so you asked for a fun fact and yeah. um, I like to tell this story just because I, it was all an accident. I okay. really stumbled into pageants on accident. In fact, I was putting myself through school. I went to Western Washington University. Um, 
And I was honestly, I had about my first two years covered with, I worked way too hard in high school. Like I had my first two years covered in scholarship. The last two years were up to me to put myself through school. I was working, I think, three jobs at the time. And looking back, I was like, dang, I was in sales before I even knew it. I was a tour guide. Yeah. Um, Okay, last two years, right, were up to me to, um, I was applying to a lot of, really anything I qualified for, actually. Yeah. And um, it was my mother, my sweet mom, who found in the Bellingham Herald a little clip, a little newspaper clip. Um, that said scholarship opportunity and now accepting applications to Miss Whatcom County 2012. And we were like, no way. No way these pageants <laughs> still exist. I have two older brothers. I grew up as a tomboy yeah. with a lot of dirt in my, you know, lots of wrestling yep. and mud, hand-me-downs, <laughs> um, all of those things. But shoot, I was like, let's go for it. Why not? And then it turned out the Miss America program is all the little pitch there is it is a scholarship program. Um, and when you compete, you compete for scholarship dollars. So I, before I knew it, I was deep in this world of it's very community and volunteer based, yeah. um, very community oriented. You have a service project for your community. So um, kind of that event world already. Um, and that love of events was there too. Um, but then when I, okay, so I was like, all right, let's do it. I competed ended up winning before I knew what I had gotten myself into. Um, once you're a title, you kind of qualify for like the next level. Right. Right. Um, which then eventually was Miss Seattle. And I have nice. to say that was the beginning of, yeah, just like building those connections and getting to be on site, getting to be a part of all different kinds of events. Um, and yeah, it's a little fun fact. It's like my, my little Hannah Montana, like two worlds. If you yeah. saw me, you would never know until I'm like there just randomly. Like, why are we wearing crowns on our head and sashes? Like, it's a whole thing. It's, it's a little silly, but it's also what you make of it, which I think events are too. And yeah, like, I mean, yeah, it's exactly. Volunteer. Yeah, volunteer based and kind of helped me uh, get my foot in the door in some Seattle spaces. Well, that's really cool. You definitely win the award for most interesting fact, I think. That's def- <laughs> that's that was very interesting. Um, I was ready to throw you off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so let's talk about the let's talk about the space. Let's talk about the venue a little bit. Um, obviously everybody for the most part knows what the space needle is, but not everybody knows about the, the garden and glass and all that stuff. I've been there myself many times and I, I I love that whole spot. So talk to me a little bit about for people that might not know. Uh, the two spaces, what they are, like how they work and, you know, the differences with them and all that. Yeah, for sure. And obviously that's a big part of my job now, right? Is right. everyone knows about the Space Needle. Um, and for the most part, Chihuly Garden and Glass. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that mm. while we are all that, the Space Needle and Chihuly, the, the whole venue, the whole experience of famous, popular public attraction that's operating every day to the public, Both spaces are private event venues, Um, obviously public, famous public attractions first and private event venues second. Um, But both spaces actually, uh, along with being the whole venue that, you know, the Amazons or Ubers or um, the, the big money clients of the world can do a whole buyout and have a company holiday party sure. um, at the top of the Space Needle. We are also, both spaces break down into much smaller private event venues too. So so we actually here at both spaces can host private events that range from 10 people to 1,500 people. Oh, wow. um, the Space Needle, yeah, a lot of people don't know that, of course, the Space Needle, you think of the top top, you've got that top house, mm-hmm. but uh, um, which is around 550 feet high and beyond. Um, but 100 feet high is our, it's called our Skyline Private Event Level. Um, I did not know and that. Back in the day, yeah, back in the day when the Space Needle used to have a restaurant, which also actually I'm still, um, that's been a part of my job too, when people are reaching out to make dinner reservations. Um, at the Mm. old restaurant. We are no longer a restaurant. The top two levels have been opened up for this whole like guest flow experience and can be bought out for private events, Um, which if you have a lot of dollars in your event budget work for you. Um, But shoot, Skyline private event level, it is the only private event level at the Space Needle, Um, but we're not needing obviously to close to the public in order to host your private event. 
So while right. you can have some big dollar elevated fancy events here, we can also do, you know, your uncle Tom's birthday party and um, even just corporate meetings and um, really standard, sweet and simple events on Skyline. And then, yeah, that's interesting because I, I would have expected like, you know, people would think like, oh, it's a space, you know, it's got to be like the most expensive thing because they right, probably have to exactly. buy it out. That's cool. So you can do it on like a Saturday afternoon while people are still visiting. You can still have this event. So it's exactly. just, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a big part of my job and what I work on now, just kind of reconnecting with we're after it, we're, we're well enough post COVID, like we are full steam ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but so much has changed at the Space Needle and actually continues to change. We're undergoing an elevator modernization project right now for the next three years which makes event logistics really fun everything has to go up and down those elevators whether or not right. have one. um but yeah it's just that yes i mean you can have that whole top house event and spend all your money but you can also there's some very very doable even budget friendly event opportunities at both spaces and similar over at shahuli you can book out the the full closure you've got the interior galleries and the the event yeah. in the glass house and there's the glass gardens um but we also have now the bar at Chihuly, which is a smaller private event space that um is right off of Chihuly garden and glass as well as some other smaller spaces that um similar like i i could book a 10 person event um for people to go hang out in the arbor room and have you know like a a lovely baby shower that's awesome that's really cool yeah i had no idea that there were so many options over there uh, it's a lot of fun. Do you know, do you guys do mostly weddings or is it mostly corporate stuff? Like, is it half and half? Like what's your main thing? Yes. I love that question. So we have a team right now. We're very excited. Okay. 2024. This is the year. This is the we year. We are finally, there was a lot of rebuilding after COVID. And then I would say too, and, and I think a lot of event and hospitality, catering, food and beverage, you know, companies can relate that there was a need for almost mass hiring. And then there was a little bit of a need for kind of weeding that out and figuring out who really was the good fit. If you're hiring a lot of people at one time, sure. it can get a little messy, but um, you know, we finally got there. We have this team. We're fully staffed. Like our team is set and ready to rock for 2024. And what that means is we have sales managers. So we're on the sales and events team, but we have sales managers and we have event planning managers. And I believe this is one of the only spaces that actually separates those two roles. Um, for example, at my last job with an event company here in Seattle, I was booking all the all of my events, right? And then I was planning those events. So you would be like from inquiry to invoice. Yes. But here it's much more um it's much more separated because it is such a massive attraction and operation. And by nature, our department causes a lot of other departments a lot of problems, right? When we're when we book that buyout, which we love because we love those right. dollars, but when we book that buyout, we are closing the Space Needle or Chihuly to the public, and people are traveling from all over the world to, to come, see it, you know, right. see these spaces. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this. So speaking of just like buyouts and all that stuff, I mean. It, What's like the availability like there? I mean, are you guys booked far in advance? Do you still have like dates open? I mean, how far do people book these things? I feel like an attraction like that's going to get booked up pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question too. And also I'm just like so excited. I was, I'll finish that the here with the sales and events being completely separate. Sure. There's now three sales managers and there's three event planning managers. And then we have our VP of sales and events as well. But the three sales managers are actually split because we're all selling the exact the same two venues. We all have the same dates on the calendar. We're split by markets. So to your question of the majority of what oh. our events look like. Um, so I know, see, I got so excited. I was like, I forget where I'm going with this. I love it. It seems like a really, really solid operation. I like that you guys got going on yeah. here, Sean. So social is in my market, which includes all of our weddings. And right. I would say within the social category, um, well, I have, I'll, I'll list a few off to give you an example. Um, social, healthcare, transportation, education. Dark sure. was reaching out for an alumni event. That would be okay. in my market. And then my favorite is sports. I'm a big sporty spice over here. So any sports-related <laughs> events are would go to me to, you yeah. know, 
to bring in the business, try and book them, build those relationships, those partnerships, and then um, host their events here in Seattle. And I had mentioned this to you in my in my forum yep. before the podcast, but like what a time for sports in Seattle. Right. Um, so the wave, you know, it kind of changes based on tech was when tech was booming, you know, Amazon and Microsoft were banging down the doors to have their events here. When things like that slowed down a little bit, you just kind of see different markets throughout the years trending in different ways. Um, but social weddings and sports have been the two most popular categories for my just overall, I would say what's kept me the busiest throughout 2023. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's, you know, there's a little bit of everything. So that's also why we have the, um, you know, like I said, like Aunt Susan, who's reaching out for her 20 person right engagement party and then the um yeah microsoft which wants to do what we call a block party which yeah. is when you bought out both Juhuli garden and glass and the space needle we fence all the way around <laughs> it and then boom, yeah yeah big money big yeah money, that, that. i thought you um, you know that would imagine big yeah and yeah. then you have an event for 1500 people um, and we're in Seattle Center, but we're not a part of Seattle Center. We're both we're privately owned, the space of right. Julie Garden and Glass. Um, but we, I think a big goal for 2024, um, and just something I'm really excited about too, is we're in Seattle Center. We have a lot of awesome, unique venues around us too. And working on those relationships, we've had events that were big enough that while Mopop isn't a part of us, we work closely with them, we're neighbors with them. And have done block parties where we're actually fenced all the way around these other venues too. And you're just oh, creating nice. this like insane ex- private experience in Seattle Center that, you know, yeah. your average guest who's purchasing a ticket to the top is never gonna um gonna know what that feels like. Um yeah. and then to your question on booking windows and where we're, I mean, we do not have an issue with um, like a lack of inquiries and a lack sure. of pretty easy to find, right? Um, but that being said, too, it's a high volume of inquiries we're working through and qualifying um, because not everybody certainly reaching out is right. um, knows what they're doing, but that's what we're here for um, or has it in their budget. Um, but kind of based on what type of event it is and what space it is changes the booking window. So yeah. as I mentioned, you can think of the the Chihuly Garden and Glass, for example, the full closure, this huge event. You have an event for 500 people with this full closure. I can book you one year out. Um, if you're looking to book a smaller space at Chihuly, we wouldn't book you until a much, much shorter window. Say you want to just book the bar at Chihuly, maybe send your guests through the interior galleries to enjoy them yeah. while... Chihuly Garden and Glass is operating to the public, but you want your guests to land at the bar at Chihuly for your private event reception. Um, that would be a shorter window, um, sure. like 60 or 45 days out. That and makes same sense. With the space needle and the space needle, especially, and there's, you know, we joke there's no space at the space needle, um, <laughs> especially when the space needle is undergoing construction, which we are. Oh, um, we have yeah. three elevators that generally operate. Um, and help us keep up with uh, public business levels as well as private event business levels. But even being down one elevator really changes the game. So some of our windows honestly just change in response to what's going on with our operation. And because they are such iconic spaces, and everybody has their eye on them. There's a lot of projects happening all of the time. Right. Um, so really... We're as sales salespeople were navigating even just um, even just the nose we get internally because we like I said are not a private event venue first and have these massive holes as a as an iconic famous attraction so yeah it keeps things interesting um, and then you're really learning how to connect with your client and send them in the right direction um, and I will also because. We're so busy to the public, especially in the summer. Our rates are, I'll say it, I'll say it, they're a lot higher. They're pretty high in the summer. Yeah. I mean, buying out the Space Needle, we we wouldn't even really consider it in the summer just because we'd be turning away so many um, general yeah, emissions. Just... Um, but that's, you're looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or 
let me tell you about like, I don't know, a Wednesday afternoon in November and you can buy up yeah. the link level for 30K. So it's just, it's a yeah. lot of understanding your client's needs and sending them in the right direction. Um, and I'm kind of working on two because we manage both properties, but they're both so different. So, um, so kind of steering them to like, maybe this actually what you're looking for, what you think you're looking for isn't the right fit. Well, let me tell you about this cool meeting space on the hundred foot level of the space. Right. Really we can do something for you, but this one might be out of the cards. Also, can I just say, I condone everybody like getting married on a Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I mean it. Seriously. I got married on a weekday. I, you know, I'm like, I, I'm all I'm for it. All for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And people are Things dropping. Are cheaper. People it's better. People are dropping money. And this is actually, this is the first, oh, yeah. these are the first spaces I've worked at with such dynamic pricing. Cause even in the same month, even the same weekend. A Saturday compared to a Sunday, it could be like easy 20K difference. Yeah. And what I've learned is people are out there and have that money and that's fun. Um, sure. But I for sure and like, you guys, it's all about the Wednesday weddings and yeah, yeah and saving oh, 20K. Are you kidding? Anyways. But yeah, I'm doing a few. I, do it's it. starting. It's, I'm, yeah. I'm doing a few Thursday weddings uh, next month, like a there Thursday in February. And I was like, this is great. I was yeah. like, I can work with whatever budget you got, really, because I'm not going to be doing anything else that day. So it's great. Exactly. Well, yeah. not whatever, but you know what I mean. Um, if anything, it'll just help weed out a little bit of your guest count, and then you don't have to pay for as much catering. That's what I say. I feel like most weddings, there's like, you know, you, you probably could, there are 40 people that you probably didn't care if they were there or not. You know, let's, yeah, let's slow it down a little bit. Um, speaking of weddings, uh, so I have some fun questions I want to ask that I ask everybody. Yeah. And these are just mostly for me because I've heard some answers all over the place. So the okay, first one okay. is, um, and it doesn't have to be wedding specific. It can be events or anything. But what's the most uh, kind of unique thing that you've seen either like a couple do at a wedding or somebody did at an event, something that you've never really seen before that you think more people should look at? Well, okay. I think that's two different questions because what's sure. something I've never seen before was I did a furry wedding at my, um, yes, at my- Wait, Like everybody dressed wedding. up as like- um, Yep. Okay. And I'll, I'll never forget it because on the yeah, tour, they asked you. about um, if we had a dress code on site and and I never really had that question before. Right. And we were like, I mean, not really. It's a private event venue. Um, just be like, I don't know, wear clothes, but like yeah. wear what you want. Oh, it was just a sea of animals. And I remember the ceremony. I remember the ceremony. I was standing behind it because I'm making sure I'm looking out, making sure everything's going well. The ceremony had just begun. And I just remember looking up and just seeing all these tails sticking out. of the <laughs> That's, a, that's that weird. That's I'd a weird one. I've never seen before. And one of the greatest couples I'd ever work with, the bride yeah. cut the cake with a machete, like full on straight arms. That's amazing. And everything they so gently and kindly approve with us first. She's like, I will be bringing a sword on site if that's okay. And we're like, how many, how many people do they have? They Was it like a big wedding? People. I can't even imagine. I mean, getting a hundred people to do that is just impressive. Like, they, honestly. They were leaning into the theme for sure. That's amazing. Um, but something I've seen that I've been like, okay, let's let's get some more people to take a look at this. That's a really good question. Honestly, kind of just back to what we were just chatting about, just being, I think COVID did really help just shake up what the, what your average wedding looks sure. like or needs to look like and really has people kind of rethinking what is the most important to you. Um, but looking outside of the Sabbath day, like save some money, use it for your honey. Yeah. Go to, of course, I'm saying that as a sales manager. Spend of course. all your yeah, money on the wedding. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. But just being more open to what, yeah, to what that looks like. And um, smaller, more intimate parties, I think, mean a lot more to me at, yeah. in the events world than they did before. And I remember how devastating that was for clients that I had booked throughout COVID that originally had their 250 people guest count and ended up with parties of 40, maybe max and watching what felt like such a plan B turn into a plan A. Um, right. And how that was really special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so similar question though. And I mean, I, you know, you had the furry thing for the interesting one, but what is probably the most cringiest thing you've seen? 
that you're like, please, nobody ever do this. This is so uncomfortable. I don't like yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, you know what really gets me is huh. people don't sit in the front row at wedding ceremonies. So, um, what is that? I've noticed it just, that because uh, everyone just thinks it's going to be a row that's saved. But unless those chairs have like have reserved reserved on them, get up in that front row because I have had brides truly in tears later that they're like, you know, in their memory, perfect day, and that's what we want, of course. And then they're going yeah. back through their photos and they're like, oh my gosh, like my photos, it looks empty and in the first two rows, and everyone's pushed in the back, like that right. just. I don't know if that just kills me. Um, and so does, I mean, the cringe for me is I'm just very like socially aware and in tune with the energies around me. And if music yeah. is not playing during your cocktail hour, we're going to have a problem. Yeah. 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 That's always Big, silence. Major silence cringe. in general is not really great. Silence yeah. is not a good thing. Silence right. is uncomfortable. I mean, you know, of all people. Oh, yeah. yeah. You understand. I, I know for sure. I'm like, I don't, I don't like silence. It's like dead air, dead air. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a big one for me. Um, and then, okay. So this one I want to ask because uh, what's your main piece of advice for anybody who's just say they just got engaged or they're just starting to plan their event? Like what's your number one piece of advice? Like step one. Yeah. Step one, hire a planner first. Like step one, I honestly, <laughs> I don't care how much you can DIY and you yes. have your Pinterest boards and everything locked down on Etsy and you're a, a, the most organized type A person of all time. Like stop it. Don't do it. It's not, it just don't do it. It's so stressful. Yeah. You only get this day once. Right. Um, right. it's so much more work than you think that it is. It's yeah. why it's such a massive industry and just already taking that off of your shoulders. Um, and I'm saying that as a sales manager and also, like I said, in my last role, doing both the sales and event planning, but not being, there's a, there's a huge difference between uh, an event and venue planning manager and a wedding planner and like day of coordinator, right? Yeah, so we're finalizing the bones of your event. Um, we're, we're finalizing our services with you, but there's so much more even beyond that, that you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. Just it's me. It, it's a better experience for absolutely everybody. Yep. Um, we used to I joke all about it. Yeah. We used to joke at a former role that like, it's always the caterer's fault. It always ends up being the caterer's fault. And it's like, I remember that bride crying. Why weren't there guests sitting in my front two rows of my wedding ceremony? And I'm going to have these photos of empty seats forever. And I wanted to say, sis, you didn't hire a day of coordinator. They might have told someone. people. Yeah. You didn't have stuff, but those are like the little details that people that will think about make a big difference. They're also the ones who bring the whole day together. There's a yeah. lot that happens even outside of venue access at any venue you book a wedding oh, yeah. at for the most part. Um, so just, just even just having someone, even if you can do it, having someone to take the pressure off of you because you'll look back and know that you weren't able to fully be in the moment of your day. And like I said, you only get that day once and it flies. Fast. It was the most fun day I've ever had. And yeah, oh, I, I had a great, I had a great, I got married. So I actually live in LA right now. And I okay. had, a, I had my wedding in uh, Silmar at this place called Reptacular Animals Ranch, who I just actually interviewed them uh, a couple weeks back. So they'll, we'll have an episode with them. Cool. And um, it was just very, it was kind of the, I did have a planner, but it was a very DIY space. Like mm -hmm. they didn't, they provided the venue and that was it. Like there was no catering. There was no bar service. Like you brought in everything, which I wanted because I work in events and I was like, yeah. you know, I worked with the planner, but I was like, I think this is what we want to do. Like I wanted that kind of open canvas. Um, and it was really, really cool. It was about a hundred degrees, but it was very, very fun. Uh, the wedding itself and there were animals and it was just, Oh my you know, gosh. Amazing. We're a little wild yeah. like that. Um, speaking of which, that was actually gonna be my last question about the venue. Um, do you guys, is everything there? Do you guys have in-house catering, in-house bar? Uh, do they need to bring in anything other than say like their entertainment and photography? Yeah. So, um, yes and no, um, we have at some event spaces, for example, the private event level on Skyline, everything's in-house tables, chairs, okay. China glassware, flatware, and linen. You can make your whole event happen with everything that's in-house and that's a dream. 
um, yeah. for the client often, um, for us as well. Um, uh, the bar at Chihuly and the Loop Lounge, which is another smaller private event space at the top of the Space Needle, those spaces come as is. You'll never make a floor plan for that space. The floor plans won't change. Everything's just like set and ready to go, including even in-house AD and background music, right? Because those are also right. spaces that are operating to the public. Um, and then you have spaces like the Glass House, which is more customizable. Um, the Glass House comes with tables, um, China glassware, flatware, but pretty much everything else we're outsourcing um, cool. and bringing in. So that's when the the event planning manager really comes in clutch because they're helping coordinate all of those details and just the complicated logistics of being in Seattle Center and not being right. a private event venue right. first and not having loading docks or having to fit everything in an elevator to get to the right level. Um, but there is a little bit of everything too. So that also goes back to just my a big part of my role and what I was mentioning earlier is that there's such a variety of what we can offer. Um, and what is already available to you, um, and, and also what you can create here on in the spaces. Do you guys, uh, out of curiosity, because I'm 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 gonna guess I know the answer, but do you guys require an event planner? We, um, I don't even want to say it's not written in the contract because it's sure, be. um, right? We, I think just with the level of events. When it comes to more corporate style events, um, and even yeah. those companies already have in-house event planners as well. Um, but for weddings, we yeah, we would yeah. require that you have a day of coordinator. And yeah. honestly, it's me catching you from the very beginning from our very first conversation, sure. just explaining to you why. Because even on the other side of that, like it, they weren't even my weddings, but being on the mm -hmm. other side of that and seeing how the little details can fall apart so fast um is just like let me just catch you before we even get to that place but i think that's good though that's also like you know people need to hear that and they need to trust that you've got their best interest in mind you oh, know yeah. it's like listen i'm not trying to sell you on anything i'm not trying to make you spend more money i'm just telling you that if you don't do this you're going to regret it <laughs> like, i know it and i've been yeah. in the in the event industry now for so long that it makes so much sense to me but i do check myself and remember if I was reaching out as a bride, not being in this world, I would have no idea. I would have no idea. And I would probably have no idea what my budget is or how much I should or shouldn't be spending right. on certain vendors. So look, hire that planner right away. Yeah. Find someone you connect with. Um, someone that you honestly vibe with too, because yes. your vendors are such a big part of your event that, um, I think their energy matters and maybe I'm yeah. just honest because I'm a vendor, if you will. Sure. But all of that energy is going into your event and what's making your event real and like turning into this real experience. Um, and I think that that can make a difference too. So uh, you're already off to a good start if you have yep. that planner on your side and then they'll connect you. Then they'll understand your vibe and then they'll be helping mm. you connect with the other right vendors. I'm still friends with some of my vendors, actually. Like I, I Good, see them every I once in a while. My yeah. my wedding coordinator actually got married the year after me, and I just played her ceremony. I was like, oh, oh it was like I a, love that. She got married on like a Tuesday afternoon, so I wasn't booked. I was like, where go. is it? And it was like ten minutes from my house. I'm like, I'll come play your ceremony. Fantastic. Don't even worry about it. So it was and I really love, and yeah, that fun. is so that even goes back to like that's why I'm in events like yeah it's a spider web it's a spider web that just continues to grow and grow and grow you're continuing to be out there exposed to new people connecting with new people constantly just like getting these opportunities to keep leveling up um with those experiences and the connections that you're making um and it just it never has to stop it's just like one door after another you can just keep yeah. knocking on uh exactly well, and okay, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do have one last question, and it might be the most yeah. important question. Um, you mentioned uh, Sporty Spice earlier, and you also said you have a dog named Ginger Spice. So uh, I'm guessing you're like a big Spice Girls fan. Is that what I'm gathering here? Yes, I'm a I'm a '90s baby. Yeah. I'm a big, I actually didn't catch that I did that either, but with sports in my I market, 
yeah. the sports in the market with Seattle sports really popping off and just these amazing events we we got to start doing. The sports market blew up this last year. Sure. Um, so I've been known as Sporty Spice in the office, but yes, my my dog daughter um, and truly the reason for um, why I work so hard every day to, to put that food on the table, to put that food in the, the bowl. The fancy floor, food, you know, the fancy food. Buying, you know. Yeah, to keep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep buying those uh, stuffed lambs that she likes yep. to de-stuff. Um, her name is Ginger Spice, and she is also a Spice Girl Sports out here, just doing our thing. Like, That's we're, amazing. We're, we're Spice Girls out on the town, just trying to add, add a little spice to the event industry here in Seattle. I love it. What kind of dog is she? She's a pit bull. Pit bull. She's a rescue Beauty. baby. Beauty. Shout out Beery and Cares. Yep. Um, yeah, she's she's my screensaver. I'm staring at her face right now. She's yeah. She's mine's girl. mine's just starting to whine at me near the end of this podcast. So I think that's gonna be my cue to go take her out after this. <laughs> it's about that afternoon time. She knows it's time for the park. It's but about that time. Snack it's time. about that time. It's it's time for all that. Anyway, yeah, I think that's all I, I've got. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll obviously link to all of your um, contacts, everything in socials and everything so people can see it. Um, and, you know, next time I'm in Seattle, I'm going to have to swing by. Uh, yes. I don't know when that will be. I was almost going to be there for, uh, uh, if only, so, spoiler, I'm like a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. And they oh, played, boy. they played the, I know, they played and the, the Seahawks on New Year's Eve. And I wanted to go to that game, but I it's New Year's Eve. It's like the biggest event right. night of the year. I couldn't do right. it. Um, so I was a little bummed about it, but I do plan on getting up there, uh, maybe catch like a Sounders game or something at some point. So, oh, yes. Yeah, it's on absolutely. our agenda. Please yeah. do. I'll say that too. I mean, um, you had asked about, you know, like discounts and things. And obviously we operate so differently that anytime we're hosting a private event, we're already we're for profit, both spaces, right. and we're already turning away a massive amount of business. So it means, while we don't have a lot of flexibility with budgets, um, I think just a big goal of mine is just to be opening these spaces. So many people don't know about the Skyline level or the bar at Shibuli. Yeah. And it's just a goal of mine to open these spaces up to our community as much as possible. So please reach out and let me know when you're around. And I would love to show you around and or see yeah. you with some tickets. Yeah, I definitely will. Uh, for sure. When next time I'm up there, I'm going to do it. I travel quite a bit, so I, I usually get around uh, all those places. So anyway, Kimball, thank you so much. We'll link to all your stuff. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you for being here. And hopefully next time I see you, will be in Seattle. Yes. Amen. Cool. Thank you, Sean. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to another episode of Eventful Endeavors, Secrets to Crafting the Perfect Celebration. We hope that we've left you with some actionable ideas for your own event. If you like the show, please subscribe and definitely leave us a review. We read every comment. So until next time, happy planning, and see you soon on Eventful Endeavors.